This is our uh, lecture number 28, and uh, this is uh, on aggression uh, and emotion. And <clears throat> this is an area in which there's been, um, you know, great diversity uh, in terms of the uh, kind of research that has been done. And uh, one of my goals is to try to uh, give you a little bit of a flavor for the diversity uh, of that research. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, a number of different perspectives um, ranging from um, you know looking at social factors uh, looking at environmental factors to looking at instinctive factors to looking at uh, biological factors so uh, uh, again i, I want to give you a, a broad perspective on this very important topic in the field of motivation uh, that of aggression and emotion uh, so when we begin to take a look at the factors that uh, influence aggression, uh, one of the things that um, I, I think is very important is that, that we first, you know, define uh, what it is that we are talking about. Uh, so <clears throat> in order to define it, I think we have to look at the major characteristics uh, of aggressive behavior. Uh, it's overt behavior. Uh, again, that very important word that we talked about um, in a previous lecture when we're taking a look at different theories of motivation, uh, intent. Uh, uh, so it's intent to do harm, uh, the intent to behave destructively towards another organism. And um, the behavior can be direct or indirect. Um, you know, physical contact isn't really um, uh, essential. Um, when you take a look at um, uh, various species, uh, namely uh, in terms of uh, uh, the aggressive behavior that you see in various types of infrahuman primates, uh, like chimpanzees, uh, for example, uh, a lot of the behavior that they exhibit is, is not direct. Uh, that is, they are threat behaviors um, that, that involve no physical contact uh, whatsoever. So let, let's make sure that we include that in any definition. Uh, and um, what happens is that um, uh, uh, this behavior, which uh, oftentimes results from frustration, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go along. Um, uh, th this behavior uh, sometimes can be directed towards non-living objects. I mean, just take a look, uh, for example, at individuals, uh, maybe their um, uh, in a line uh, purchasing um, uh, uh, a ticket, let's say, for, uh, you know, at a kiosk for a train and something isn't happening uh, correctly in terms of when they deposit their money or their credit card or whatever, and they become very frustrated and they, they start kicking the machine. I mean, this is an example of aggression being directed towards a, a non-living object. Uh, and lastly, I think we have to emphasize intent, but also the uh, this whole idea of perceived intent, uh, meaning that um, uh, you know when when we take a look at, at defining whether or not a behavior is aggressive, uh, that person or that uh, individual that is on the receiving end of things, if they perceive it to be a threat, that's all that counts. Okay, so indeed we have, you know, all these characteristics, major characteristics, uh, and again, uh, just to re-emphasize, you know, intent is absolutely crucial uh, in, in determining whether or not an, uh, an act is an aggressive act. And again, it doesn't have to be towards a living object. Uh, and, and perceived intent is just as good as uh, evaluating, you know, you know uh, intent uh, on, on, on the part of, uh, you know, a neutral observer, for example. So perceived intent, um, uh, crucial. Uh, so again, these are some of the major characteristics that, that we've identified, that psychologists have identified. And I think that one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure uh, that we do look at a number of different factors here. Uh, so again, one of those questions that we have um, uh, is this whole nature-nurture question. 
And uh, whenever we think of this, you know, I think of some of the more, you know, outlandish uh, examples of aggressive behavior that uh, have been in the news. Uh, this individual that you see on the left here, Andrew Golden, um, uh, uh, he, uh, he and a friend uh, killed four classmates uh, and a teacher in an elementary school in Jonesboro, uh, Arkansas, a number of years ago. And from a very early age, Andrew Golden, uh, as you can see here, um, uh, was taught to, to, to fire uh, hunting rifles, had early exposure uh, to hunting uh, rifles. Um, this individual here on the right, probably a little bit more recognizable, uh, was Adam Lanza. Uh, he fatally shot 20 children and six adult um, uh, faculty and staff members at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. And uh, he had a history of exposure to firearms. Uh, and again, this was uh, from a very early age. And uh, he also uh, had a great affinity uh, for playing violent video games. Uh, would this argue that perhaps, you know, nurture is incredibly important uh, in terms of aggressive behavior? Well, I suppose it would. But one of the things that I want to emphasize to you is that um, uh, this is very complex, you know, the study of aggressive behavior. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that we cover all the bases in terms of understanding, you know, what factors may be involved in this behavior. Uh, so the major determinants of aggressive behavior, we're going to look at our environmental factors, we're going to look at instinctive factors, we're going to take a look at biological factors. Again, we're going to try to cover a lot of different bases. Um, so the case for environmental factors, um, you know, certainly, you know, when we take a look at societies, um, uh, when we take a look at cultural factors, for example, uh, when we take a look at things like just simple handgun ownership and how difficult it is or how easy it is in various cultures and in various countries, uh, that indeed may dramatically uh, influence um, an individual's outlook on, on aggressive and violent behavior. I mean, just take a look at these very interesting statistics. In Detroit, Michigan, which consists of about 2 million people uh, and about 700 uh, gun-related homicides um, every year. Um, in England, 50 million people and only about 150 gun-related uh, homicides uh, every year. Um, what's responsible for that difference? Is, is it related somehow to the ease with which uh, uh, we can purchase guns? Um, is it related to some important cultural factors uh, about how uh, you know we we uh, view uh, uh, violence and, and, and um, you know what uh, young people, for example, are exposed to? Uh, during their early formative years? Um, is it related, for example, to uh, the amount of television violence that, that an individual watches? I mean, it could be a variety of different things, but there are these differences that, um, um, you know, just absolutely jump out at you uh, uh, that, you know, we have to try to explain, you know, on, on some level. Um, some of the most interesting work that has been done in this area is that involved in uh, just uh, you know a simple variable and that's viewing television violence uh, when you take a look at primetime television programming uh, 82 percent of it contains some aspect of violence you know the annenberg um, uh, uh, media uh, uh, institute of um, uh, for the study of media at the university of pennsylvania regularly tracks this. Uh, and again, you know, we're up to 82% of primetime uh, uh, programming uh, shows, uh, uh, you know, those shows contain violence. So to me, that's a, an alarmingly high figure, given the fact that, you know, a lot of kids do watch, you know, uh, uh, primetime um, uh, entertainment, but it's not just primetime. I mean, it's Take a look at just, uh, you know, a lot of things that uh, are available for kids these days. Um, that's, you know, not necessarily during prime time, but let's say in the middle of the afternoon or in the morning, you know, contains, you know, uh, violence. A very interesting and important study 
done between 1977 and 1995 research by a very uh, distinguished and pioneering psychologist by the name of Leonard Eron. He studied aggression in kids um, uh, up uh, on up until you know early uh, adulthood. Uh, and this was done in Hudson, New York, you know, a place not too far uh, from uh, Albany. Uh, and it's simply called the Columbia County Longitudinal Study. And essentially what they did was they interviewed parents, they interviewed um, uh, peers uh, of kids, they studied 800 kids, um, and um, also, you know, tracked the amount of violent television programming they watched. Um, it took a look at uh, how they behaved in school and then, you know, on into early adulthood. And their, their findings or this finding, this, this longitudinal study is really considered to be one of the best uh, that has ever been conducted uh, in this area. And essentially what Iran found was the more violence and, and aggression a youngster watch on television, regardless of what their age was, their sex or social background, the more aggressive they were in their attitudes and in their behavior. And this is something that was seen over the course of their um, early uh, uh, years, educational years, and then later on uh, in terms of their uh, adult lives and the uh, probability with which they would be arrested for a violent crime. So again, this is a, a, a landmark study. Uh, it is one which, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, you know, no one has ever <laughs> done, you know, such an extensive study in the past. Uh, um, and it is, you know, often used as some of the primary ammunition for those who are uh, against, uh, very much against uh, violent uh, television programming. Um, there's also other studies that have done in which they take a look at parents, for example, who watched a lot of television as children. Um, they tended to punish their own children uh, more severely than parents who did not watch uh, as much a, a television program, especially violent television program. So that too is interesting. And then there's the very famous no-tell study in Canada that was done between 1973 and 1975 in which researchers took a look at uh, uh, a few, I believe it was six uh, different uh, towns in the western part of uh, Canada. I believe it was in uh, Van uh, Vancouver, um, uh, in the province of uh, uh, Vancouver. And this is where there was no television programming, but then uh, by way of uh, satellite television programming arrived. And, and what they did was they took a look at before and after before the television program, programming came in and then after the television programming came in. And what they found, for example, is that second graders were, were twice as aggressive towards each other. Um, and again, this was measured by acts of, of uh, pushing and taunting. Uh, and th this, this occurred after the television programming became available. Um, so uh, again, you know, very interesting studies that these two arguing that the environment can play uh, an important role. Uh, another way of taking a look at, uh, at some of these issues is to take a look at the whole issue of pornography and the viewing of, of pornography. Um, uh, is that responsible for violence towards women? I mean, by its very nature, uh, pornography is um, uh, aggression uh, and, and violence uh, uh, towards a woman. And um, when you take a look at, at research that's been done in this area, there are some studies that have shown that women who reported being abused by their partner, a very high percentage of those partners, 41% use pornographic material. So that would argue that, you know, viewing you know, pornography can indeed have an impact uh, uh, on men uh, in terms of um, uh, their uh, 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 exhibiting aggression and violence towards a woman. But there are other studies that indicate that prolonged exposure to por pornography um, uh, or there, there are other studies that, that support that claim, showing that um, if you are exposed uh, uh, to pornography, that it leads uh, to uh, acceptance um, of this aggressive act, acceptance of rape and acceptance of abuse of women. So these two 
uh, studies would, would tend to support the notion that uh, violent uh, pornographic uh, material can indeed impact um, uh, males in terms of um, their um, uh, how they go about treating uh, women. Uh, but there are other studies that indicate that maybe it's more about just simple male dominance, uh, you know, the power structure of uh, uh, certain societies. It's, it's not pornography per se uh, that causes violence. And indeed, if you take a look at some cultures in which uh, the male is not dominant, and we're talking about some uh, native uh, uh, cultures in, in certain parts of uh, Indonesia, for example, and Borneo, uh, parts of Australia, where it's the female that's dominant, not the male, you don't get um, this uh, uh, violence uh, that's exhibited towards women. So again, the, these are interesting studies, very interesting studies to keep in mind. Um, certainly um, those um, uh, animal behaviorists and ethologists like Conrad Lorenz, for example, uh, believes very strongly uh, that certain aspects uh, of aggression are indeed instinctive, meaning inborn, meaning really genetically determined. Conrad Lorenz extensively studied uh, male stickleback fish. Here's a male stickleback fish that you see right here. Um, and uh, if you take a look at uh, an excellent book that Conrad Lorenz wrote some years ago, which is considered to be a classic in this area, simply called On Aggression, uh, he notes in that book that animals um, uh, of one species will kill members of another species. Typically, they do it for food uh, or maybe if they're, they're threatened, but they, they don't kill out of hatred or prejudice or for the fun of it. And those seem to be traits, really, that are distinctly human traits. Uh, so aggression, he says, has really evolved to its highest level in the case of the human being. Um, if you take a look at um, uh, the instinctive nature of aggression that he studied in male stickleback fish, he studied what's called the head dipping response. Uh, the head of the male rapidly dips down and then back up again, then dips down and back up again uh, when the male encounters uh, another male, a strange male, a male that may be invading its territory. And that's a threat response. And that threat response, um, you know, signals to that intruding male that aggression is going to occur, an attack is going to occur if that male uh, in, uh, encroaches upon the, the, the territory any further. Um, all males exhibit this response, all male stickleback fish exhibit this response, even if they're isolated from an early age. Uh, the response is incredibly stereotyped, uh, meaning that it's the same in you know, all behavior really reaches its peak. You know, it intensifies during the mating season when a male is uh, courting a female and protecting that female. Uh, the, this behavior really escalates to a very, very high level. So again, Lorenz uh, believes in the instinctive nature uh, of aggressive behavior. Uh, and indeed his, his work with a variety of different animal species would bear out, uh, support his, his conclusion uh, uh, that um, um, you know, certain aspects of aggression are ones that don't really require any significant learning that really are ones that are evident from a very early age. So um, this is, uh, again, something that argues uh, in favor of this uh, uh, instinctive nature uh, of aggression. A whole nother very interesting uh, area of research here has to do with the relationship between pain and aggression in something that's referred to as shock induced aggression you know do we as a, a human species or do we animals uh, if they uh, are um, exposed to a you know a very painful situation whether it's physically painful or psychologically painful is a reaction to that an instinctive reaction to that is it to lash out and exhibit aggression uh, in response to that pain well, uh, there's been some, you know, very interesting research uh, that has been done uh, in this area in which they've looked at the phenomena of what's called shock-induced aggression. Here you have uh, two uh, male rats that have been placed in a cage, uh, having never seen one another, and 
what they typically do is investigate each other. Um, uh, usually they're quite social to one another, but what uh, researchers have found is that if you apply shock uh, to their feet uh, periodically, maybe a 10 second shock uh, every two minutes, they'll rear up on their hind legs almost in a boxing posture and begin to attack and bite one another. This is called shock induced aggression. Uh, when we take a look at research in this area, one uh, psychologist by the name of Nathan Azrin uh, has uh, contributed a great deal in, uh, in this uh, area uh, and indeed has uh, taken a look at a number of different factors that may be involved in this shock induced or what also some call pain induced aggression. If you take a look at that research, one of the things that he finds is that the strength of the shock, that is the intensity of the shock, is important. The stronger the shock, that is the more painful the shock, the longer the aggression lasts, uh, this, this uh, shock-induced uh, uh, aggression. What he also finds is that if you administer the shock very frequently, let's say, you know, a 10-second shock uh, every uh, 30 seconds, uh, the more frequent the shock, you know, as opposed to a 10 second shock every five minutes. Um, the more frequent the shock, the more vigorous are the attacks, the more vicious are the attacks. What he also finds is that animals don't habituate. That is, if you were to take uh, two, two male rats, place them into a cage, administer the shock to them over an extended period of time, several days, let's say, uh, where that shock is occurring maybe for 10 seconds every five minutes. They don't habituate. That is, the behavior continues. Uh, it doesn't diminish uh, at all. It doesn't go away. And um, uh, what um, Azrin also found was that isolation from the time of birth doesn't diminish uh, the response. They also find, his research team finds, that females are just as likely as males uh, uh, to exhibit uh, this behavior. Um, and uh, uh, probably most interestingly, what uh, Asrin finds is that uh, a psychologically painful stimuli, uh, which can be very frustrating, uh, can also cause aggression. For example, one of the very interesting experiments that he did was to take two males, uh, two male uh, rats that were cooperatively pressing a bar in order to obtain food uh, in a Skinner box. Uh, and uh, what uh, um, um, Azrin also did was to take a, a small uh, stuffed animal and place it in the back of the cage, which the animals pretty much ignored. You know, they were just interested in getting food and pressing the bar to obtain the food. Um, but then what um, Azrin uh, did was uh, to put th those two animals into extinction, meaning that uh, pressing the bar now produced nothing, no food. Uh, and what happened was the behavior of these uh, uh, two animals became uh, very frustrated and they started uh, attacking one another and um, they would also uh, attack that um, uh, stuffed animal that was placed in the back of the cage. Uh, so indeed, um, this led this kind of finding, uh, and it was finding not just restricted to that of, um, uh, of Azra and others found the same thing, really led to one of the major theories that is called the uh, frustration aggression hypothesis that was generated by two very distinguished psychologists, Neil Miller and uh, John Dollard. And essentially what this says is that you know, we can experience frustration when we're prevented from obtaining a particular goal. Uh, and um, if we cannot somehow get around that barrier, um, our behavior is going to become uh, increasingly uh, frustrated. Um, and the barrier can be a physical barrier, it can be a psychological barrier, it can be a symbolic barrier. But the, the fact of the matter is that 
um, uh, behavior in those kinds of situations becomes more and more frustrated and less logical and more emotional. And indeed, the likelihood with which an organism is going to exhibit aggression increases. Certainly, this accounts for a great deal of aggressive behavior that we see in the case of human beings. Uh, and indeed, the, this theory uh, advanced by, by Dollard and Miller, the frustration aggression hypothesis, a major theory uh, in this whole area of the study of aggression and emotion. Um, I want to now get into um, the work that has been done, taking a look at the uh, 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 biological factors uh, that may be involved in this behavior. This is a very famous case here in 1966. I think probably one of the first cases of mass murder uh, here in the United States. But this individual right here, uh, Charles Whitman here, you can see him on his wedding day. This is his wife. Um, and um, uh, what happens over a period of their first three or four years of marriage is that uh, he begins experiencing very uh, intense headaches and he begins having uh, marital problems with his wife. He is seeing a psychiatrist in order to try to get help uh, in terms of uh, the headaches uh, that he's experiencing. Um, and um, he separates uh, uh, from his wife uh, and um, uh, he's a, an excellent marksman. Uh, practices at a rifle range, uh, um, usually several times a week. Uh, and uh, um, what happens uh, is indeed uh, tragic. He keeps a diary uh, in terms of every single day about how he's feeling and the headaches that he's having and so on. And um, he writes in his diary that he's going to kill his wife. Uh, and indeed, uh, that day, he takes a, a rifle, puts it into a bag, um, and uh, walks uh, two blocks uh, to where his wife is living uh, with uh, her mother and proceeds to kill uh, his wife and his uh, mother in cold blood. He walks back uh, the two blocks uh, to his house, writes in his diary that he killed them. He has remorse uh, for having uh, killed them. Uh, and then what he does is he proceeds to go, uh, this is all in Austin, Texas, and he proceeds to go to the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, uh, takes an elevator uh, up to the very top of the administration building, and then over the span of about, I believe it was about a 90 minute period of time, uh, he shoots and kills 14 people and wounds 31 others. And indeed, this is where uh, Charles Whitman was. Uh, the highest point on campus at the time, simply uh, with a telescopic rifle killing <coughs> innocent people. Uh, uh, Texas State Troopers stormed the tower, captured him, killed him. Uh, an autopsy was done on him, and interestingly, he had a large uh, tumor, what we call an infiltrating tumor, in the amygdala and temporal lobe area, certainly the amygdala, very much involved in, in emotion uh, and aggression. So this is one of the first indications that maybe some aspects uh, of our biology and the fun uh, proper functioning of our brain may be involved uh, uh, in aggressive behavior. Certainly, uh, you know, the uh, psychological changes that uh, Whitman was going through that he recorded in his diary and also discussed with his psychiatrist, uh, we cannot um, uh, exclude uh, the, uh, the effect that the separation had uh, between he and his wife uh, had in terms of, of his behavior. Um, but, um, you know, this really prompted others to begin to explore the, the, the biology uh, of aggressive behavior. This is a very interesting syndrome, the kluver busi syndrome, um, highly aggressive male rhesus monkeys. Uh, this is a, a research that was done over in France uh, in the 1970s. Um, these rhesus monkeys had portions of their amygdala surgically removed. And what, what was found 
<clears throat> was that uh, they became very docile, uh, very calm afterwards. Uh, they wouldn't exhibit aggressive behavior. They, they wouldn't protect themselves when they were attacked. Uh, and this is very unusual uh, for, for uh, rhesus monkeys. So again, some interesting evidence here that maybe we're talking about, you know, a part of the brain, the old part of the brain, the amygdala uh, uh, being involved. Um, this too, very famous research done by Jose Delgado, very famous uh, Spanish researcher who um, was uh, working with uh, a, a number of different species uh, looking at, at aggression, but perhaps best known for his work with uh, the very aggressive bulls in which um, he had implanted in their brains. Uh, in the amygdala and many other parts of their brain, these stimulating electrodes. And what he would do is he would stand in a um, uh, bullfighting uh, arena. Uh, the bull would be released from the opposite end of the arena and you perhaps can't see it all that well, but in his hand uh, is uh, what was called then a tele-stimulator. And it was something that was a little bit bigger than a remote control that you would see for a television. And there are a series of buttons on it, each button corresponding to a different uh, electrode that had been placed in a different part of the brain. And what he found was that this charging bull uh, could be made to be docile if he stimulated the animal in the area uh, of the amygdala. Uh, indeed, uh, stimulating the animal in other parts of the brain had no effect. Uh, so indeed, this, was, this too was uh, interesting, very interesting work in terms of the biology of aggression. Certainly some of the best research uh, that was done in this area was work that was done by John Flynn uh, at, uh, in the psychology department at Yale University in which uh, he uh, worked with cats uh, and would stimulate cats uh, with, with stimulating electrodes in various uh, parts of their brain and, and take a look at their behavior. And uh, if you take a look at this uh, cat that you see right here, uh, whenever Flynn stimulated the lateral hypothalamus, uh, it produced this, this predatory kind of aggression. Here you can see this cat uh, attacking a rat uh, in this uh, what he called quiet biting attack. Uh, so again, the, the cat suddenly jumps on, pounces on the rat, and delivers a fatal biting blow to the head and neck. And uh, Flynn really believed that this was a predatory aggression. That's when he stimulated the lateral hypothalamus. Um, but when he stimulated the medial hypothalamus, um, this produced um, uh, what he called irritable aggression. Here you can see the cat. It's being stimulated in the medial hypothalamus. Uh, the cat is uh, arching its back, it's hissing, it's snarling, it's baring its teeth, and eventually, what it's going to do is it's going to attack and bite the rat. But notice that this behavior is markedly different from the behavior that you see up here of this cat that is stimulated in the lateral hypothalamus, where you get this very different kind of aggression that we would call, you know, predatory aggression. And this is what we would call um, irritable um, aggression. So indeed, Flynn was one of the first individuals to show that, you know, different types of aggression are probably mediated by different parts of the brain. Certainly an incredibly important finding. When we take a look then at Flynn's work, you know, we're talking about, you know, this part of our brain, the hypothalamus uh, uh, that we see uh, right here. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, other parts uh, of the old brain, when stimulated, uh, didn't seem to produce uh, any uh, of these effects. Um, so again, that's important <clears throat> because there's uh, many different parts of the um, uh, what we call the old brain that mediate emotion, uh, parts of the brain like the thalamus, like the septum, for example. And it may be that different types of aggression are mediated by different um, uh, areas of, uh, of the brain, different parts of our biology. If you also take a look at the contribution that the hormone testosterone plays in aggression, you see some very interesting things. You know, males, of course, develop with this hormone. Females don't. Uh, the primary uh, 
uh, glands that secrete these are, are the, the uh, testes um, that you see right here in the male. Uh, females, of course, do not develop uh, with uh, testes and hence are not exposed uh, to that hormone, testosterone. So let's try to understand a little bit about hormones. They're chemicals that are secreted by different endocrine glands. Uh, they have very distinct effects on uh, morphology and behavior uh, of um, uh, individuals. Uh, and indeed, the testes, um, the male reproductive glands that, that secrete testosterone, um, as we learn more and more about it, we know that it's involved in supporting uh, many different um, gender-specific behaviors, uh, aggression being one of them, but certainly various aspects of uh, supporting male uh, sexual arousal that we will uh, soon uh, learn about. So uh, the ovaries in the female, these are the reproductive glands that secrete estrogen and uh, progesterone. Um, um, you know, again, males uh, and females develop differently in terms of, of, of those uh, uh, different structures and uh, different hormones that they're exposed to during uh, development. So very um, pronounced sex differences in the aggressive behavior of humans and lower animals. If you take a look at the research that's been done in this area, you know, what you find is that males uh, typically exhibit uh, much more aggressive behavior than do females. Uh, it's a very well-known sex difference. If you take a look at sex differences, for example, in violent and aggressive behavior in humans, and again, this comes, you know, right from uh, uh, crime statistics uh, that are maintained. If you take a look at simple assaults, aggravated assaults, and murders, look at, how, look at the likelihood with which males in the red um, uh, exhibit these behaviors and the likelihood that females do. There's a huge order of difference here by in the neighborhood of 10 to 1. Uh, so again, these are, you know, you know, very, very interesting statistics. And again, go out on a playground, take a look at a playground uh, where young kids are playing, take a look at rough and tumble play where males exhibit a lot more rough and tumble play than do females. Take a look at it in terms of, let's say, uh, elementary school, middle school. Um, you know, who's getting reported more for aggressive acts? Who ends up in the principal's office for, you know, more, uh, you know, physical, you know, kinds of behaviors, aggressive behaviors? You know, it's males. It's not females. So these sex differences then are, are, are very uh, well known. Uh, so, um, when this is studied in lower animals, and I want to talk about, you know, one piece of research that was done a number of years ago by a scientist, a psychologist by the name of Dave Edwards. He was very interested in this sex difference that appears in aggressive behavior, where, uh, you know, take two males, put them together, um, and, you know, strange males, and, and soon what will happen is they will begin to attack one another to establish dominance uh, and subordinate uh, relationships. Females typically don't do this. Uh, so again, this is a you know an interesting finding, and Dave Edwards being a, uh, having a very good background in the field of endocrinology begins to think, well, maybe this is related to the fact that males are developing with testosterone and females aren't. Does um, what many consider to be a landmark piece of research in this area, uh, in which he 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 changes the early hormone profile of males and females. Uh, you know, we talk about critical and sensitive periods of brain development, for example. And one of the things that we know is that males uh, uh, of many mammalian species develop with that testosterone and it begins to surge, you know, very early in life. Uh, and um, uh, maybe he's, the Edward says that the difference between males and females is the fact that males undergo this surge uh, and females don't. And maybe that's why males are more aggressive than females. And indeed, he does some very simple experiments. One in which, for example, he castrates mice at a very early time, uh, just after they're born. 
and uh, what he finds when he allows them to grow up into adult life is that they're not aggressive, uh, that instead they act more like females. Uh, and in the second experiment that he does, uh, he injects female mice uh, very early in life with the male hormone testosterone. And what he finds is that those females now act just like males. They, they become very, very aggressive. Uh, so indeed, this was you know, one of the first indications that this gender difference in uh, aggressive behavior may be related to the fact that males develop with that hormone and females don't. So now, if you take a look at some of the research that was done uh, by uh, a primatologist, psychologist, by the name of Robert Goy, where he actually starts taking a look at the brains of males and females. And he begins to notice something very interesting in a part uh, of the brain, uh, the hypothalamus. If you take a look at this diagram that you see right here, um, here's the hypothalamus right here. And um, if you take a look at an area of the hypothalamus that's called the sexually dimorphic nucleus, in males, um, it is much larger than it is in females. And what Goy finds is that uh, if he changes the early hormone environment, um, uh, injects a female with testosterone, for example, her brain begins to take, a, be, uh, looks like that of a male. And uh, what Goy finds is that if he takes uh, a male early in life and takes the testes away from the male, um, and so that male now is developing without being exposed to testosterone, that the brain looks like that of a female. So we know that that hormone is being taken up into that part of the brain in the limbic system, in the hypothalamus, a part of the brain that uh, we know to be involved in sex differences and a wide array of different behaviors. And it appears as though that testosterone was actually changing the structure of the brain. Uh, testosterone promotes a female, uh, a male brain and the absence of it and that brain looks very different. It looks um, uh, very, very different. That sexually dimorphic nucleus does it is much, much smaller. So then along comes uh, some other researchers by the name of Raisman and Field, uh, in which they not only take a look at that sexually dimorphic nucleus, but they take a look at it at a, on a microscopic level. And they begin to look at individual neurons and they see something very, very interesting. If you take a look at females and uh, the, that sexually dimorphic nucleus, which again is much smaller in females than males, what you see are axons that terminate on dendrites. And this is called axodendritic synapsing. So again, these gaps that you see between neurons um, what you see, uh, the, these uh, spaces here, um, the axon is terminating right on the dendrites. That's what you see in females. The typical kind of female brain in terms of um, uh, the, the synapsing that takes place is axodendritic synapsing. What you see in the case of males is very different. Uh, males, you see mostly axosomatic synapsing where those uh, axons are terminating instead on the cell body. You know, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, you know, the, the structural differences in the brain on a microscopic level, individual neurons, male and female brains are, are looking different from one another. So he does a simple, they do a simple experiment in which they take a male and castrate that male early in life, then allow it to grow up into adult life. And they begin to take a look um, at the brain of this animal. Uh, and this male now begins to show the, the female pattern of axons terminating on dendrites. Do the reverse. A female that's injected with testosterone early in life shows the male pattern, the axosomatic pattern. So indeed, you can change the structure of the brain and you can change the synapsing, the type of synapsing that takes place by modifying the early hormone environment. 
So that's an incredibly important finding uh, in this area that indeed may be responsible for some of the sex differences that one sees in terms of aggressive behavior. So a theory that evolved uh, uh, from this is something that's called the organization activation theory uh, in terms of testosterone effects upon behavior. Uh, and again, this is something that we're also going to be taking a look at in terms of uh, sexual uh, behavior. But this theory essentially says this, that there are two periods in which testosterone is very important for promoting male behavior during early life, prenatal uh, and early neonatal life. Uh, if the brain is exposed to testosterone and then later during pubertal and adult life is exposed to testosterone, the brain is organized during early life, it's activated later on, uh, and again, uh, we get male-like uh, behavior. So testosterone during early life really has a dual action. It's masculinizing the brain, meaning it's promoting male-like characteristics. But what it's also doing is it's defeminizing the brain. It's suppressing female characteristics. And again, this is something we'll come back to when we get on into the area of the study of sexual motivation. Testosterone during pubertal and adult life activates behavior. So again, this is simply called the organization activation theory uh, of testosterone effects uh, upon behavior. Let's talk uh, about, you know, a, a couple of very interesting human findings here. And let's talk about a syndrome that was studied by John Money, the very famous uh, endocrinologist, psychoendocrinologist, on uh, a disorder uh, that's called uh, progestin-induced hermaphroditism. And you frequently see the acronym just PIH. This was accidentally produced in some genetic females when their mothers were prescribed what are called progestins, which are, which are synthetic progesterone. And they're prescribed this because they have what's called an at-risk pregnancy. In a woman who experiences a miscarriage, it's often the case due to the fact that they don't have enough progesterone that's being secreted. Progesterone is very important for supporting the uterus, uh, uh, supporting uh, the developing uh, fetus. Uh, and if a female doesn't have enough of it, then uh, it can result uh, in, a, in a miscarriage. So um, these progestins, of which there are many, many different varieties, were being prescribed to women during this period of time, this is in the 60s and early 1970s, and lo and behold, one of the things that was found was that many of these progestins had male-like qualities, uh, male hormone-like qualities, that the, their biochemical structure is not all that different from uh, testosterone. So what was happening was there was virilization uh, that was taking place uh, in these uh, females, um, uh, these genetic uh, females uh, who were being carried by these mothers who were prescribed these uh, progestins. Uh, usually surgical uh, correction was done at the time of birth uh, because uh, there was a, an enlarged clitoris uh, that had, uh, had been produced. Uh, and these females now uh, were studied over the course of their development. And indeed, many of them acted like um, boys and were actually called tomboys and were recognized as being tomboys in their communities. They showed rough and tumble play very similar to that of males. They showed elevated energy expenditure just like males, preferences for masculine clothing. Uh, they were indifferent to babies. They preferred uh, non-domestic careers. They lagged behind age mates and babies. Uh, these are very interesting findings, uh, and indeed, they were ones that uh, were heavily touted at the time uh, as, uh, um, you know, hormones, uh, testosterone and testosterone-like hormones uh, have the capability uh, of masculinizing um, uh, the brain. Uh, and indeed, um, there's caution that has to be exerted here because Maybe, you know, the parents were fully aware uh, of, of what had happened uh, and indeed uh, were being coached uh, by uh, physicians and psychiatrists. 
Um, they may have uh, overreacted in many situations um, to uh, what was happening in their daughters uh, that had apparently been uh, masculinized. Um, so again, is this biological or is this environmental? Um, and again, uh, the, these studies are, are ones that uh, one could argue, um, you know, pro perhaps both ways. Um, but then uh, another very interesting study, and this is the last one that I'm going to talk about before we get into the area of sexual motivation in our next lecture. It was work that was done at the Kinsey Institute for the Study of Sex, um, and that was done by psychologist June Reinich, uh, who was working on this uh, prenatal uh, uh, progestin exposure, but was doing it in a very different way. I mean, she scoured the country for uh, doctor's records um, uh, of women who were being exposed to these uh, progestins in order to uh, treat a, a, pot a potential uh, at-risk uh, pregnancy. Uh, and indeed, um, the exposure um, interestingly, the, the amount of these progestins that was being used was much, much less than what was seen in the case of um, uh, the John Money research. So the exposure didn't really result in external virilization where the clitoris would become enlarged and almost penis-like in appearance. Um, so you don't have that important complicating factor where these are individuals that are that are going to be undergoing um, you know a, a, a surgery in order to to make correction um, what she did was to extensively study their personalities and their attitudes and what she found was that they were very very similar to that of males and i'll give you just a little bit um, of an example here um, of uh, what we would call the potential to exhibit aggression. It's simply a, a paper and pencil test uh, in which these uh, females um, are confronted with various situations uh, where um, they are asked, you know, how would they respond if they were confronted with X, Y, and Z, okay? So uh, what if you were confronted, for example, with the following situation? You're in line in a movie theater. It's a very long line, very popular movie. You're there to purchase um, a ticket for the movie, and uh, someone comes and butts in front of you. Now, typically in that situation, males do uh, one of two things. They either exhibit uh, physical aggression towards that individual or verbal aggression or a combination uh, of the two. Um, and, and rarely do they do, I guess, what you would call, you know, the smart thing, which is either to do nothing or maybe appeal to the, to, uh, to the manager of the movie theater. What was found with these uh, uh, females that had been exposed to these progestins while they were in their mother's uh, womb was that these females acted just like normal males, okay? Normal females, again, do the smart thing. They, you know, appeal to the manager of the movie theater or they do, uh, or they do nothing. But these females that were exposed to these uh, male-like uh, hormones we're much more likely to exhibit either verbal or physical aggression. Indeed, that's a very interesting finding. Uh, so um, again, let's let's stop here. We're, we're going to get on into the area of sexual motivation in our next lecture. Um, but um, uh, these are interesting studies, and they argue that maybe you know hormones are playing a very important role uh, in terms of how they're impacting the brain uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, the potential uh, to exhibit aggression. So again, we'll revisit this when we take a look at the area of sexual motivation.